About five years ago, <clears throat> a designer from the Netherlands, a landscape architect, moved with his family to the land of the free, home of the brave. He was a partner in a large, larger, well-established firm and had just won an international prestigious design competition. As the project director and responsible for the project, which was the design of a new large city park in New York City, he was sent there to set up shop. Upon arrival, the economy crashed, and the impact was significant. For me, it affected every project that I was working on, but also, regretfully, the dynamics within the firm I was with. It was a good thing, too, because it gave me the chance to look back and self-reflect, and I realized that I was tired of what had become a routine, a traditional way of working. I was a bureaucratic <laughs> and no longer a creative professional. I felt that my work could be better, more nimble and swift, <laughs> more responsive and more resilient. So I did what I had to do and I started a new practice for urban design and landscape architecture in New York. I wanted to bring together a design team composed of young, eager, highly educated, highly talented professionals of various disciplines, an architect, a landscape architect, an industrial designer, a um, scientist, um, a branding specialist, almost like a musical group that is composed of individual talents. A diverse team, 100% collaborative and 100% creative. It was also time to start thinking about a different working approach, because there were so many projects built around us that have no character to them, or let alone make character. They're all the same. There are those mega firms out there buying all the small ones. They make it even worse. And I don't want to be working following some sort of formula for design. I don't want to be a style shop. I believe in the identity of a place, in a tailored approach, the roots of a place. By creating designs that really address the unique and inherent qualities of a location, we can make cities, parts of cities, that really make sense there. It is our job to make places, public spaces, that are successful, popular destinations, that are sustainable socially as well as economically, that have a reverberating effect on the immediate adjacent urban fabric that work as catalysts for economic growth. But could I do that? I'm only a Dutchman in America. I work as a master planner, as a landscape architect, <laughs> but is my Dutch way of seeing things, a limitation maybe? I mean, my background, the background of my profession as a landscape architect in the Netherlands is far different from any other place. It's much more utilitarian, let's say, much less from the hand of the artistic master. Let me give you a quick overview. As many of you know, the Dutch are infamous for conquering the oceans. Unlike today, no sweethearts. <laughs> However, I consider their most successful conquest their own land. 60% of our country is below sea level, all reclaimed land, which means that since the 1600s, the Dutch have been pumping out water, pumping, 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 day in, day out, year after year. By the way, you all know what those pumps look like. Those are the iconic Dutch windmills. Now, the freshly reclaimed land turned out, turned out to be very suitable for agriculture, pastures, so colonization and exploitation of the land could start. The dairy industry developed into a very successful one, a very efficient industry, and that is what shaped 
the landscape of our country. All man-made and highly engineered. In fact, in 2013, the Netherlands, although being one of the tiniest countries in the world, still is number three <laughs> on the world ranking list of agricultural products exporting countries behind the US and France. And milk is the most important product. And the cows are very happy. <laughs> because the dairy industry became even, even more efficient and condensed, and the smaller farmers started selling their property to the larger farmers, who then started selling their land to local municipalities. And that's how former pasture land turned into suburbs. Today, half of the population lives there, in those areas that are so highly dependent of constant pumping and extremely vulnerable uh, to flooding, which happened a lot in the past. After decades of floods uh, killing thousands of people and sometimes wiping away entire villages, the Dutch government decided once and for all to protect the lives of their uh, people and their assets and gave commissions to build extremely impressive protection measures. Huge dams and the most advanced storm surge barriers in the world were built. And once again, the Dutch manipulated the course of nature to their benefit. And this, this is what the history, the background is, the origin of my profession as a landscape architect in the Netherlands. The projects that I work on are usually located in places that are the opposite of where I'm from. And then I realize that I have to approach a project with a different attitude as where I'm from. I have to start from scratch. I have to start relating to the local context in order to do a proper project. Well, I'm the kind of guy who sometimes thinks a little bit too hard about these kind of things, because they are simply a scientific name for my dilemma. It's called brain plasticity. It means that the human brain has the capability to rewire itself. So, wait a minute, good news. All that I have to do from now on is adjust or reverse my thinking process with every venture. Think it and be it. Makes sense. In some areas, people suffer from depressions caused by lack of sun exposure. Elsewhere, we have to pre uh, make a lot of microclimate and, and shade structures. We stay on the right side of the road, they stay on the left. Adapt. A few examples. We were very pleased to do a project in the New England region when Brown University invited us to do a, a master planning project joining their team for the expansion of their campus into the jewelry district in the downtown of Providence. Well, not having been in Providence ever, I had no idea. A big surprise. It was nothing like I had imagined it. <laughs> Nevertheless, we proceeded with the project and we designed a bridge, a wooden structure that connected the, the campus of College Hill with our jewelry district, which was partly a bridge, partly a public space over water. And in the heart of the district, we designed a new plaza around which development would uh, be built. We wanted to um, relate, refer to the, the historic feel of the project, of the Jewelry District once being a thriving part of the city. And of course, we cannot use the same materials anymore, and since concrete or asphalt are simply not an option for us, we developed new products even, like the pavers. We used the New England maple trees, and we developed a custom tree grade that's now considered the jewelry for the jewelry district. Other example, Minneapolis, Minnesota. For the main uh, shopping street, not a very special place. Failing retail, lack of upkeep and bad detailing. We were inspired, poetically inspired, I should say, by the geology of the area, of the region as well as by the patterns of the mighty Mississippi River. 
patterns that literally ended up in our design. We also came up with a quite an inventive solution for creating more space. We counted every single element furnishing on the street and had the idea to consolidate those in islands that in plan almost look like the knots in wood grain, creating a lot of more uh, circulation space. Also, by doing that, by providing more root space for the trees, we were able to give the place six times more green than currently is the case. So not a very traditional streetscape, uh, shopping street setup. Uh, we intended it to be a, a, an attractive and compelling address for retail and commerce, and really wanted to touch on the authenticity, on a really genuinely, uniquely Minneapolis feel. We designed a new building in a place where there currently is a failing department store, 90% is vacant, and by taking it away, all of a sudden we could make more space, a new public space, and that new building, that market building. In the winter time, the harsh winters of Minneapolis, comes in handy that we can close the roof. In summer, it's open, the market is outside, and in winter, the market is inside. So, year-round destination. Sacramento, California. <laughs> Many interesting uh, initiatives are going on in the city, in the downtown and near the downtown. One of them, just right across the river, is called the Bridge District. The name comes for the, from the iconic uh, Tower Bridge of Sacramento. Now, since we know that good design instigates development, we were commissioned by the developer to design and conceive a pilot project and we were inspired by what Sacramento stands for, agriculture. We designed a, an interesting, a small but quite iconic building, made entirely out of wood, clad with wood shingles, and it reminds you a little bit of, let's say, a young sprout of a vegetable plant. Perfectly suited for uh, a beer garden or any related type of function. It's intended to be a magnet for the place, and we know that once people start coming, there will be more. Next example, what I call Las Vegas 3.0. <laughs> In the final, scenes of, <laughs> the final scenes of the movie Casino, Robert De Niro looks back at his career as a mobster in a, in a corrupted Las Vegas, and he regretfully explains about the new corporations taking over, the big corporations. He calls it, it looks like a Disneyland now. What he means with that is that the big corporations were addressing families and children as their business. And that's why it started looking like a theme park and with you know, rides in hotels and whatnot. The same big corporations saw their, econ their business take a dive a few years ago. And they discovered that the family business wasn't a very sustainable one. They don't spend anything. Now, the new market trend is the young, partying, clubbing, let's go crazy kind of crowd. <laughs> That's Las Vegas 3.0. One of the most influential books in the history of modern architecture is this book, Learning from Las Vegas, by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. And it basically describes Las Vegas by analyzing the architecture along the Strip, was, which was designed to be seen from the car. Venturi sketched this legendary sketch, which says it all. Come inside, on the outside, I'm just a, a billboard. Many de decades later, the Strip looks like, like we know it, and it's attracting millions of visitors a year. And they're all pedestrian. The strip was never fitted out or intended for this kind of traffic on flip-flops. <laughs> the big corporations now are trying to change that. And we are part of the team, of a team, that's uh, doing one of those uh, initiatives. Our client, who owns a lot of stakes along the strip, 
asked us to design a pilot project, a first phase of transformation of the strip into a uh, public realm, pedestrian realm, in front of the two major hotels, New York, New York, and Monte Carlo. Las Vegas, as we know it, soon as we knew it, construction already started. Existing ornamental elements are being taken away that were useless anyway because they prevented pedestrians to, to go towards the facades of the casinos. The hotels are addressing that trend too, are opening up to the public with, with cafes, with bars, with shops, etc. So it becomes a real space, the strip as urban fabric, who would have thought? Besides the pedestrian promenade, we are also designing the first park in history along the strip. Inspired by the colors and the patterns and the geometries of the desert, the park will become an attractive, lush, programmed uh, place with pavilions and, and a, new, uh, a new sports and, and events arena. Well, maybe it's not the very first park, because a lo very long time ago, when Las Vegas was still the wild, wild west, it was a green oasis in the desert with springs and trees. So who would have thought authenticity in Las Vegas? <laughs> I think that we can and we should make designs that are related to the identity of a place. All that we have to do is adjust our bandwidth, our creative frequency to the place. Because if we do so, we can make a project come to life, bring out the soul. I also think that a project should have a heart. And I also think that the project should have balls. <laughs>